Hi folks, welcome to this video on the theories of arousal, one of the sports psychology topics. There's four key theories of arousal. Um, so we'll deal with each one uh, in turn, and then in a separate video we're going to look at um, how we deal with over arousal and things like that. But first of all, drive theory. So, what we've got here, as you can see, is that arousal is along the x-axis and performance is on the y-axis. So what we've got is a linear relationship. In other words, as arousal increases, our performance gets higher and higher. However, it's not quite as simple as that. So let's look at some of the key terminology. What we actually mean is, as arousal increases, so does our chance of producing a dominant response. Now the key thing here is a dominant response is our main way of doing a particular skill. So there's two ways of looking uh, at this in particular. If I am experienced, if I am, you know, uh, an experienced performer many years, that's going to be a good thing. Why? Because my dominant response is more likely to be correct. If I'm experienced, the way of doing the skill, the dominant response, because I'm well trained, is more likely uh, to be correct. And so an experienced performer will want a high arousal level. Okay? In contrast to that, a novice. This is going to be a bad thing. Because a novice's dominant response is more likely to be incorrect. So what we're basically saying is, experienced performers, according to drive theory, want high arousal to get the best out of their performance. Whereas a novice, according to drive theory, wants low arousal. Because their dominant response is more likely to be incorrect as they are a novice. They haven't learnt the skill well enough yet. And the other thing we can really say about drive theory is it only really applies to growth skills. You're jumping, you're throwing, you're weightlifting, things like that. Hence why when you see these jumpers and throwers at the Olympics, they like to get the crowd going, you know, clapping and chanting and things like that. That's going to increase their arousal level, which is going to, in theory, increase the quality of their performance as long as they are experienced performers, okay? Hence why as well... The one nice and quiet in sports like snooker because you don't want a high arousal level because that's not a gross skill, it's a fine control skill. So there's drive theory. So next we've got inverted U theory. Now as you can see again, arousal is on the x-axis, performance is on the y-axis. And what we're seeing here is as arousal increases, performance gets better and better and better up to a point where we're at what we call optimal arousal level. However... If arousal continues to increase beyond this point, we actually start to see a decrease in performance. Okay, so let's get that down first. So what we've got is we've got as arousal increases, so does performance up to a certain level, up to a certain point, And the optimal arousal level leads to the highest level of performance. Now what we've got on here, if I'm just going to draw it um, very crudely but very basically, is... We want to get our performer's arousal level somewhere in there, right? Now that is called our ZOF, also known as our zone of optimal, or optimum if you want, functioning. I.e., my performer is going to function at their best, at their optimum, if I can get their arousal level somewhere in there. So this is what inverted U theory is all about. Getting our performance arousal level to be somewhere in that range where, the, where we're going to get the best performance out of them. Now the thing is, that's dependent on a few factors, being able to, to, being able to get them into that particular zone. So in no particular order, Complex tasks, so your precision tasks, they want lower levels of arousal to get you into that zone. Whereas your gross tasks, your again, your your jumping, your throwing, your sprinting, we want higher arousal levels. So what we're seeing is the nature of the task will affect where your zone of optimum functioning is. Okay. Again, similar to drive theory, what else is going to affect whether I'm in the zone of optimum functioning? If I'm experienced, again, I want a higher arousal level. If I'm a novice, I'll want a lower arousal level again. Okay? 
And finally then, the personality type of your performer is going to be a factor. So your extroverts are going to want higher arousal levels because they're the ones who like sociable experiences. They want big crowds close to them in order to get the best out of their performance. Whereas an introvert, quite a quiet, shy, timid person, they want lower levels of arousal. You, I, I, you might be thinking, well, like, hang on, what do you mean by higher or lower? Are you talking about this being low and this being high? What I mean is think of it like this. If I was to draw that graph but say, look, there's two inverted U's, okay, and there's one zone of optimum functioning, and there's another zone of optimum functioning, and if we, you know, if we say that arousal is again on this axis of performance there, what we're saying is, to get into this zone of optimum functioning here, on this inverted U, this will be for complex tasks, you'll want lower levels of arousal, this will be for novice performers, Again, want low levels of arousal, and your introverts, they'll conform to this inverted U here. Whereas your gross skills, your experienced performers, and your extroverts, they'll conform to this inverted U. We're all different. We all have different personality types. We all have different preferences. We all have different skill levels. So there isn't just one inverted U for all people on this planet. We will all have different inverted U's all the way along here. We're just looking at general principles and general patterns. Now, the next theory is catastrophe theory. Now, this is a version of inverted U, hence why we're seeing a very similar thing at the start. As arousal increases, performance gets better and better, up until we get to this zone of optimum functioning again. However, where is the difference between inverted U and catastrophe? Well, it's fairly obvious. If you look, now, as arousal continues to increase, instead of there being a gradual fall in performance like there was an in inverted U, there is a sudden dramatic drop in performance, okay? So what we've got on there, you know, we're saying that optimal arousal is needed for best performance, i.e. we've got to get arousal levels somewhere in this zone here. If we are below that, we're not going to be optimal performance standards. If we go above that, however, we're going to see a drop in performance and that drop is going to be rapid when we become over aroused. So there's the, it is a version of inverted U, but there is a definite difference between inverted U and catastrophe. I believe we can also associate this word with it, choking. When a performer chokes, when their performance goes to pieces in the big occasion because they've got wound up too much, okay? Now a final point we can make is we can recover this. So when we've got gone through catastrophe theory as a performer, we can bring this back. We, you know, we need to calm down, we need to relax, we need to get the arousal levels to drop a little bit. But that is going to be dependent on how much into over-arousal we have gone. If we've gone too far, we probably can't bring it back. Also, it depends on the length of the event. If there's only a few seconds or minutes to go, something like that, we're not going to be able to bring it back. Equally, if you're level of over arousal you're choking has led to a disqualification or a red card there is no chance of bringing it back okay um what we're thinking about is you know think of rory mcelroy when he the first major he led going into that final round out of the u.s masters when he was four shots in front and he ended up losing by eight shots he, you know, he dropped down from 1st to 15th in the final round of the US Masters. He had plenty of time to try and bring that down. You know, he, he definitely underwent catastrophe theory. He got over-aroused by the fact that he was leading a major for the first time going into the final round. It led to a dramatic fall in performance, but he wasn't able to bring it back. With a bit of psychological training, he probably would have been able to do so. So catastrophe theory is a version of inverted U. Finally then... This one's a bit unique. It doesn't look like the other graphs we've seen. The first obvious thing is we haven't got arousal here and performance there. This is known as peak flow theory. You will probably know it as something uh, something else, something that you've heard in a lot of sporting terminology. And that is in the zone. That there is the zone, the area between this line and this line, also known as flow. When you are in flow, you are in the zone. So, what is this one particularly referring to and how does arousal play into this? 
what we've got on the x-axis is, is your, it says action capabilities on this particular graph. It basically means your skill level. So actually, let's just start with that, your skill level, your ability. And as it says on uh, this axis here, action opportunities, challenges, let's get some more common sense terminology in that. Skill level of opponent. Just got enough space there. Okay. So what we're basically saying, we're saying that if you have your skill level is here, okay, this area on the graph, and let's draw it. Say your skill level is here, and your opponent is a quite a weak skill level in comparison to you. You are not going to be in the zone. You are going to be bored. Okay, so there's no real challenge there for you. Equally, if your skill level is here, let's say, just change the colour of my pen, is here, and the quality of your opposition is very, very high, you're going to find yourself in this area, and you are going to worry. You are going to be anxious. You are going to think that I can't cope with the situation. So, when does the zone occur? Well, the zone occurs basically when my ability level is equal to the ability level of my opponent. When I find that balance, I am in the zone and I experience flow. So what can we say about it? Well, athletes report being in the zone or experiencing peak flow when their skill level is matched by that of your opponent, as we've just done, as we've just demonstrated here. You know, if you've got a misbalance, you're going to either get bored or you're going to get anxious or worried. They also report that when they're in the zone, their movement feels effortless. You know, everything they do is just working, it's very efficient, there's no wastage of energy. They have high levels of self-efficacy, just so confident in what they're doing. And finally, it feels like they're on autopilot, which means they don't have to think about absolutely executing the skills anymore so they can devote more brain time to tactics and strategy. So, you know, another reason why they are highly successful. So again, this theory depends on not being anxious, not being over-aroused, you recognising that your ability level is matched by that of your opponent. So they're the, th the four key theories of arousal. What you need to be used to be able to describe them and explain the factors that affect each one. Hopefully you found this video useful.